And I know that we're few in number today, and we've got some that are out sick, but um, we are thankful that we're still able to be here, and we do look forward to the time when everybody else can come together. Uh, continue to pray for those that are struggling with different sicknesses, and uh, we've got quite a few people on our prayer list that we've been making mention of, so make sure you remember to pray for them. All right. We are actually going to turn the chapter. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 21. So we've spent several Sundays in chapter 20, and um, we finished that up this morning. And now we're going to get into Matthew chapter 21. Uh, we'll see how far we get. I'm going to read at least down to verse 17. And we're going to talk about the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ. Now, that is often what this, ref this is referred to, the king's entry or the triumphant entry. And it's interesting because we know that within a matter of days, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to suffer and die on the cross. And so why is this considered the triumphant entry? And we'll get into that as we look through. And I think that as you see what happens, you understand why it's called the triumphant entry. I also think about that song that we just sang, right? Victory ahead. The chorus says, victory ahead through the blood of Jesus, victory ahead. Listen, the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ may have been only days away from the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ, but understand that was the only way redemption could come. That was the only way that we could have forgiveness of sins. That was the only way that our ransom could be paid. That was the only way that we could have victory is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ entering in to the city showing himself to be king, even though he was going to be crucified in a few days, was a triumphant thing. It was him fulfilling prophecy, declaring who he was, and how he was coming to bring peace. Just not in the way that everybody thought at first. And so we'll, we'll talk through this triumphant entry of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to uh, Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a, and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, Ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a great multitude spread their garments in the way, Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And who was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And he left them and went out of the city unto Bethany, and he lodged there. You see here Matthew's account of the triumphant entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We actually find that this is also recounted in the book of Matthew, uh, in the book of Mark, that's in chapter 11. 
You find it in Luke chapter 19. And you also find part of it in John chapter 12. Each of them give a little bit different aspect and a little bit more information. But the story is all the same. Now, in Matthew, for example, Matthew tells us that Jesus said, Go get this ass and this colt. And if anybody says anything to you, here's what you're supposed to tell them. But Matthew doesn't recount that anybody challenged them. But when you read the other Gospels, you find that when they went and they just wandered up to this place and they untied this colt and this ass and they started to lead it away, guess what? Somebody said, what are you doing? And what did they do? They told them what Jesus said. The Lord has master of the, the master has need of this. And they let them take them. Each of those Gospels shares very, very similar account. And so let's just talk about this for a minute. There's an amazing story just getting up to the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ. The Lord says, <clears throat> okay, you and you, I want you to go over here to this village. And when you get into the village, you're going to find uh, a donkey and the baby or the colt of this donkey tied up. Untie him and bring him to me. Guess what happens? Those two people wander into the village, and guess what's sitting there waiting for them? Exactly what the Lord said would be waiting for them. Again, just another example of, of the Lord and His um, foreknowledge and how He knew exactly what needed to be done and exactly what would happen. So they go into this, they go into this village, they find these things here, and they bring them back. Now, it's interesting, because I think it's in the book of John. Let's see if I can find this. It says, um, oh, let's see. I can't quite find it. Um, yeah, John chapter, John chapter 12 verse 16. It's really recounting the same story. Um, but it says in verse 16, it says, These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that, the, they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. What that's talking about is in Matthew, Jesus sends them to go get this donkey and its colt, and Jesus then enters the city on this. But it also says in Matthew, the whole reason this was done was to fulfill prophecy. And then it gives us the quote from the Old Testament. <clears throat> Matthew is writing after the fact. And in the dialogue, he's saying, this is why we did this. John tells us that at the time, they didn't make the connection. When, when Jesus said, go get the donkey and the colt and bring it back to me, he got on and he rode into the city. None of them were thinking about the Old Testament and how the Old Testament had prophesied that that's how the king would come into the city. Matthew doesn't tell us that. But John says, none of us understood that until after the Lord Jesus Christ was glorified and then we remembered how he entered into the city of Jerusalem. I just thought that was a neat little note there that we often think about um, the entry of Jesus and how that fulfills this Old Testament prophecy and yet the people that were living it, the people that were going through it at the time didn't make the connection until after Jesus was killed and rose from the dead. But nonetheless... That's exactly what was happening. It was fulfilling prophecy. Matthew chapter 21 verse 4 says, All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. Now that is actually, that prophecy is found, and we'll get to this in a minute, that prophecy is found in Zechariah chapter 9, now the question becomes is why would you come into town riding on a donkey or the colt 
of a donkey. Why would you do that? Especially if you're coming in as the king, right? I mean, let's just admit it. You look at a horse, and a horse is a majestic creature. Lots of power and strength. Donkey? It's actually a very strong animal, but like, we don't really think about donkeys as being majestic creatures, right? How many of us go around going, oh, did you see that beautiful donkey the other day? Man, did you see how powerful that donkey was? Like, just don't do that, right? Now, a horse, oh, did you see that horse running in that, oh, so beautiful. Look at the power in that thing, right? Horses are built as animals of war. They are strong. They are brave. <laughs> they go where they're sent. But that's not how Jesus came into the city. And we talk about this being the triumphant entry of Jesus. And yet he came riding on a donkey maybe even the cult of a donkey. And so many people have asked the question, why? And I think there are multiple answers to that question, um, some more obvious than others, uh, some more commonly heard than others. But I will say that it is often said that kings on horses are a sign of war. It's a sign of battle. It's a sign of coming in in great strength and power as a ruler. Whereas kings coming in on a donkey or being pulled, a chariot being pulled by a donkey or by mules instead of horses is more a sign of a king coming in peace. It's the idea of the king coming not to declare war, but a king coming in peace. I think it was also interesting that as I studied this, I had never seen this before, um, but it's actually uh, history and some other things teach us that in the Jewish nation, up until after Solomon, their rulers didn't come in riding on horses. There's multiple accounts prior to the end of Solomon's reign where the kings and the different rulers, not that there were that many kings before Solomon, but that the kings before Solomon and uh, the other rulers before Solomon often, often came riding on a donkey or on a mule. Matter of fact, there's a verse that talks about the nation of Israel, their rulers weren't supposed to have horses uh, they were, it was this thing of the Lord wanting them not to trust in Egypt and the things of Egypt and the strength of Egypt, but to trust in Him. So it's interesting uh, that when you go back to some of the earliest Jewish kings, they came presented not on horses, but on donkeys or on mules. So it kind of ties Christ back to some of the kings like David. Um, and it ties back to some of that early, uh, the early kings of the Jewish nation. It ties back to that idea of one that is leaning on the Lord for strength, not the, the weapons of war. It also is an indication of royalty. So although... A king might sit on a horse in a sign of um, war. A king in some cultures would often sit on a mule or a donkey in peacetime, still considered as royalty. We don't necessarily think about it that way today, but that was actually not uncommon back then. So to sum it up, if you think about it this way, to come riding into town on a donkey was actually a sign of peace, humility, and yet still a sign of royalty and power. What a perfect blend of things to show who Jesus Christ is. 
Yes, he's coming to town as king, but he's coming to town as the king of peace. He's coming as a royal figure. He's coming as a king, as a leader, as a ruler, but he's coming humbly and meekly as a king of peace, not a king of war. He was actually coming as the king that was about to give his life for his people. And I think that that's what's so amazing about the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ as he comes presented on this donkey coming into town, both as being presented as somebody that's royal, but yet also somebody that's coming meekly in peace so meekly that he's about to give his life for these people. We also find that it says in verse 5, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. That right there is actually referring to Zechariah chapter 9, if you want to turn over there. Zechariah chapter 9. Verse 9 says this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. That is a very specific statement about how one day the king of Zion would come into Jerusalem. But he's going to come in great lowliness and humility. And he's going to come bringing salvation and bringing justice. Riding on a donkey. Now, as you read the rest of this chapter, it goes on and it says in verse 10, And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from river even to the ends of the earth. Now, he does come as a king of peace, and he comes to bring peace, which would mean getting rid of the chariots of war, getting rid of the horses of war, breaking the battle bows, and speaking peace even to the heathens. It's easy to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and say, well, he came in lowly and meek, riding on this donkey, but, but he didn't break the Roman government. He didn't overthrow them. Listen, there's coming a time when he will come as a king of war. There's coming a time when he will destroy all opposition. And he will bring even physical peace. But he came to Jerusalem as one coming to give his life to bring peace. The annihilation of opposition is much, much later. Right now, he's coming as the Prince of Peace. It's not the way we would expect it. It's not the way we would expect for the chariots to be cut off and the horse to be cut off and the battle bow to be broken and for him to start to speak peace unto the heathen and to have dominion. His plan is maybe not the way we'd think it would be. And I have no doubt that these people that had seen him do miracles and turn the water into wine and the, and the, uh, to, to feed the thousands and, and all these miracles he's done to raise people from the dead, I have no doubt they thought he was going to come in and become king physically. I think that's why that later on some of these same people were the ones in the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. He came not as the king they wanted, but he came as the king they needed. 
And some of them hated him for it. This is such a picture of one that comes to bring peace, but yet there's no lack of authority, and there's an overcoming in this. There's an overcoming that you see in these passages. This idea of one coming in peace, but that doesn't mean weak. He's coming to overcome. He's coming to overthrow sin and death. And to make the way of salvation. I think it's also interesting to note as you think about this triumphant entry on a, a donkey. If you would, turn over to the book of First Kings. Because some people will still look at this and say, well, that's no way for a king to be announced to his people. But listen. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 37. As the Lord hath been with my Lord the king, even so be he with Solomon. Make his throne great, greater than the throne of my Lord King David. So Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Chetherites and the Pelethelites went down and caused Solomon to ride upon King David's mule and brought him to Gion. And Zadok the priest took an horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. And they blew the trumpet and all the people said, God save King Solomon. And all the people came up after him and the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy so that the earth rent with the sound of them. When Solomon was reigned, when Solomon was anointed king, he came riding in not on a great horse, but on a mule. A mule is the offspring of, of a donkey. And you find here that that's exactly the way Solomon came in. And it was very similar to Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. It was with great rejoicing and with great shouting. I just think it's kind of neat when you look at Jesus' entry as king. It's very, very similar to Solomon's entry to the people. Now we also see as we go back to the book of Matthew, <clears throat> we see that um, this is a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9. Uh, in verse 6 it says, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. Find the donkey, find its colt, Put some, uh, put some garments on it, set Jesus up on this, and now Jesus is making the final trek into Jerusalem, riding on this donkey. It says in verse 8, And the great, a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That looks a whole lot like Solomon's entry into the people. They are treating him as a king coming into his city. Can you imagine Jesus is riding on this mule? We've got a great multitude that's following him, potentially even a couple of those, those blind guys that he healed coming out of Jericho, right? I understand that some time has passed as they traveled, but those two were following him. He has this very great multitude, and this multitude is watching this one, this great Jesus of Nazareth that can raise the dead, that can... That can Heal the blind and make food from nothing almost. And they're excited. And they're shouting. Hosanna. Hosanna means, oh, save. It's a great sign of adoration and praise to somebody. They're shouting as Jesus comes into the city. And it says that they take their garments or they cut down palm branches. One of the other Gospels says the branches they cut are palm branches. 
palm branches would kind of be like, not like a big hard stick like we think of, but more like a palm tree, right? Where it's a really leafy and you can almost use it like a, like a fan, right? Now there's two different beliefs about this. Some people say that whenever it talks about strawing them in the way, uh, that, that it, people believe that they were throwing them down in the road to make, to make an entry into the city, almost like laying out the royal carpet, rolling out the red carpet for the king to come in on. They were throwing their garments down in the way, and they were throwing these palm branches in the way that even the very donkey that he rode on wouldn't have to put its feet in the dust. Now others don't believe that they were throwing them on the ground. Others believe that they were, they were waving them like banners or flags. And as they were waving them, they were shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna to the Son of David. Remember, Son of David can be a phrase to indicate the Messiah. Oh, save thou Messiah. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Man, they are giving him a king's entry into the city. And I said it a minute ago, I think. I'll say it again. I actually believe there were true believers in this multitude. I also think there were some people that were following him because of the miracles and because they wanted a ruler to deliver them from the Roman Empire. And you see here a people that were treating him as one that was going to be set on the throne. But it didn't turn out the way they thought it was going to. And it isn't long until the multitudes in Jerusalem are not shouting praise and hosanna to the highest. They're crying out, crucify him. Crucify him. Can you imagine the scene here? They're singing, they're shouting, they're waving things, and people that weren't part of it would be hearing this as it gets closer and closer to the city, and, and, and the noise is getting louder, and you see this guy riding on this donkey, and people are waving things, and they're shouting, and they're, they're rejoicing, and people start to ask each other, who's this, what's going on? Who's this great person coming into our city? Who's coming? It's Jesus. It's the son of David. You can sense the excitement. I want you to look over in the book of Luke for me. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I want you to notice one thing. Luke explains a little bit more about what they were shouting in verse 37. It says, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. They are shouting and declaring you to be king. You better tell them to be quiet. And it's in this story where Jesus tells this very, very well-known passage in verse 40. I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. That's something that Matthew doesn't recount that, at that part. But they're shouting and they're singing. And not only are they saying, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna to the highest, they're declaring him king. And when the Pharisees say that they need to be rebuked, then what happens is that's when the Lord says, I can't tell them to stop. If they were to stop, the very rocks would shout out my name. So he is being declared king. 
Some of them were actually calling him king. And now imagine again Solomon coming in to be anointed king. It's a very similar picture. I also want you to note while we're in Luke that it's at this time that Jesus actually weeps over the city of Jerusalem. Although it is the triumphant entry and he is coming in and they're shouting praises to his name and he's being declared the king, we find in Luke chapter 19 verse 41, and when he was come near and beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come unto thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. As Jesus is coming in, fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, about this king coming in, meek and lowly, and sitting on this donkey, we find that he comes as a, as a king of peace, even though him coming is an indication that at one time, sometime in the future, all of the enemies will be overthrown, but not yet. And as he comes in, knowing why he's there, knowing that Jerusalem is missing him, and they're not seeing him, he's weeping over them, and he actually prophesies that Jerusalem will be destroyed. Not long from here, Jerusalem is destroyed, very much in the way that Jesus described, besieged and eventually destroyed. To the point where they do talk about like not a stone on another, like wiped out. And so it is a triumphant entry, but it's also... You see in this, as Jesus comes into the city, knowing what's going to happen to them, he weeps over the city. He weeps over the city. All right, if we go back to Matthew again, Matthew chapter 21. All of this is going on. The multitudes are crying out. We see in verse... 12, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables and the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Jesus makes this triumphant entry. People are shouting and praising his name. He comes into the temple. And by the way, I believe that one point earlier in his career, he had already done this, where he cast out the money changers. You find that in John early in his ministry. And you find here at the end of his ministry, he does it again. And he quotes and refers to an Old Testament passage and talks about the fact that his, his house was meant to be a house of prayer. In Isaiah chapter 50, 56, verse 7, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And yet what he finds is that they are just out to make a buck. They've turned it into a den of thieves. They're out there seeing who they can jip, who they can, who they can uh, take from, wheeling and dealing and seeing if they can get a better deal than they deserve. They've turned it into a house of thieves. We we'll also find in verse 14, And behold, the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, so listen, there's this great ruckus as he comes into town and people are waving things and throwing things in the road. He's, he's riding in on this donkey and, and people are shouting Hosanna and they're talking about the king and 
Jesus has said, if they don't, the rocks are going to cry out. Jesus goes into the temple. He casts out the money changers. And it seems as if as he goes to heal people, and, he, and he's healing some blind, he's healing some lame people, the shouting hasn't stopped. The, even the children, it says, are gathered around him shouting, Hosanna! That's what it said in verse 15. And the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Man, listen, there is an energy in the city this time. There's an energy in the city. Jesus has been to Jerusalem before. He has done mighty acts. He's done miracles. He's ticked off the Pharisees before. But listen, this time is different. This time he comes in as king, fulfilling a prophecy, declaring another prophecy, healing people, cleansing his temple, and as the, even the children shout out, Hosanna to the son of David. Now do you understand why the scribes and the Pharisees are almost panicked, really, and they're their aims of destroying Jesus magnify greatly past this point. Well, man, he just entered as king. He just entered with royalty. He just entered with the people behind him. He just entered with one showing power. And even the kids are shouting praises to his name. Man, the Pharisees and the scribes, the Sadducees, are panicked at this point because he has come as king. And they come to Jesus. It says they were sore displeased in the last half of verse 15. And then in verse 16, they come to him and they say, Hearest thou what they say? Do you hear what these kids are saying? Listen, they didn't believe he was Messiah. They didn't believe he was the Christ. They come to him saying, do you understand what they're saying? They're calling you king. They're calling you Messiah. You need to tell them to be quiet. Don't you understand what they mean? And Jesus simply looks at them and he quotes an Old Testament scripture to them and says, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. Shouting, singing, waving of things, throwing things down, cleansing the temple, healing the sick. And in the midst of that, little kids shouting praises to his name. You can feel the fervor and the energy in town. And the Pharisees say, you got to get them to shut up. This is not good. And Jesus says, hmm, don't you remember? Don't you remember what it says in Psalms? Don't you remember what it says in Psalms chapter 8? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, Hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger? Now, the, the Lord's recounting of this verse is a little shortened from what we see when we read Psalms 8 verse 2, but it is obviously the same context. Man, the Lord has come, and even out of the mouth of babes, his strength is being declared. He is being praised for who he is and what he is. And his strength and his ability is even being declared by these young children. And yet the Pharisees wouldn't see it, couldn't see it, didn't want to see it. But even these little children could see it and declared it. So here in this short few 17 verses, we see the Lord miraculously know that those donkeys were waiting for him. 
mirac- uh, come into the city in this great fervor, fulfilling prophecy, declaring more prophecy, cleansing the temple, healing the sick, and denouncing the Jewish rulers of the day come in great power and great strength is what he did. It is the triumphant entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, we understand the fact that he's about to die. Jesus himself knows that. But that doesn't mean that this isn't a triumphant entry. Because Jesus has come and this time Although he's going to come in and out of Jerusalem over the next couple days, he is here in Jerusalem to stay until his death. And within days of this triumphant entry, the Lord is going to willingly lay down his life, die on the cross, and raise again three days later. And he does that to bring peace to people that don't have any. He is the king of peace. And he has now come as king. And he's declared himself king. But not the way they expected. Now. He does eventually come the way they expect but they missed it they missed how he was originally going to come and those that missed it are going to be on the wrong side of when he comes back they thought it wasn't what they wanted they thought it wasn't what they expected they thought this can't be the king this can't be the way the king the king wasn't meant to die the king is going to rule from one end of the world to another and his kingdom is going to last forever it can't be this oh but what they missed was that it was his dying for our sins that brings eternal life it was his dying for our sins that opens the door for him to to, for him to rule and reign for, with us forever. Listen, he's always going to rule and reign. There's no doubt about that. The peace that wouldn't have been there without his death and resurrection was our ability to be with him. Little did they know that this king that came with great pomp and circumstance and shouting and singing Little did they know that he was coming to give his life for them. Now I will tell you and we'll close with this. There is coming a time when he does come as a conquering king. This time he came as a king of peace. This time he came as a king ready to lay down his life for his people. But there is coming a time when he will come not riding on a donkey but riding on a horse coming in a sign of great battle and war matter of fact if you'll turn over to the book of revelations revelations chapter 19 I'm going to start in verse 11 And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen and white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the wine presses and the fierceness of uh, wine presses the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Someday he's coming back like that. Totally different than the way he came into Jerusalem. Humble and lowly, riding on a donkey as a sign of peace and humility. Someday he's coming back 
with a flaming sword, openly declaring that he is king of kings and lord of lords. In verse 17, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. And these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Some of these people that were shouting, I think, expected him to come in and set up his earthly kingdom and to overthrow the Roman government. And when that's not what he did, they didn't want him anymore. But little did they know he was laying down his life for their sins. And that one day he would come. And he would come as a conquering king. And he would overthrow every nation that opposed him. And one day he will rule physically on this earth with a rod of iron. But that wasn't why he came in Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, he came because you and I are sinners and had no hope of redemption, had no way to pay our ransom, had no way to become right with God. And yet he came and he died, even though he was declared king. This was a king willing to die for his people. And he died for us that we might have redemption. For those of you that are lost, our prayer is that you would see him as king and see him as not just this king that's going to rule with a rod of iron, but a king that was willing to lay down his life for his people. A king that was willing to die for those that didn't deserve it. And a king that's one day coming back for his people. And a king that will rule perfectly. We're thankful to know that we serve a kind, compassionate, merciful king that gives peace and rest. And one day he will overthrow all evil. And he will overthrow all wickedness. And he will bring eternal, lasting peace. And his dominion will be a dominion for everlasting. That's the king that we serve. That's the king that one day is coming. We sang that song, The Kingdom Coming. That's what that's talking about. It's talking about one day he comes back and he will rule forever, perfectly, justly. And he's going to wipe away all tears and all sorrow and all grief. And all those that have rejected him, all those that wouldn't believe in him, all those that wouldn't repent will be cast eternally into the lake of fire and will have everlasting condemnation. But it doesn't have to be that way because the king laid down his life that you might have redemption. All right, we're going to go ahead and end there. Thank you for your attention.